You guys are so expeditionary. It's wonderful. Got everyone? Come on. All right, we got a big cast of characters here. Well, it's wonderful to be here in Osceola County. I want to thank uh, the folks we have with us today, Mayor Blackwell. We have C City Manager Bill Sturgeon. We also have Representative Fred Hawkins. I have Dr. Kenneth Shepke, who's the Chief Medical Officer for the Florida Division of Emergency Management. Um, and then we have folks um, who are going to tell their stories about receiving early treatment for COVID. Paula and David Roman, Dennis Sharp, um, and Chrissy uh, Mal uh, Malukowitz. I had it in the car, too. I was reviewing it. <laughs> um, well, we th thank you guys for here. So uh, over the last many weeks, uh, we've been able in the state of Florida through over 20 state-supported sites uh, provided early treatment in the form of monoclonal antibodies to nearly 65,000 uh, Floridians. Uh, during that time, we have seen admissions to hospitals decline. We've seen the hospital census decline. We've seen visits to the emergency department for COVID uh, decline. And so we're happy that this is something that uh, people have really uh, had success with. Um, and that's what it's all about, early treatment, saving lives, keeping people out of hospitals, uh, making sure they can have as quick a recovery as possible. Now, if you uh, are looking, obviously, since the beginning of the year, this has been something that's been available under an emergency use by the, by the Food and Drug Administration, both the Regeneron, which we use here, as well as the Eli Lilly, which is now actually uh, going to be approved again uh, for, for more wider use. Uh, these are things that have been in the repertoire. Uh, they've been used in Florida. A lot of hospitals have used them. Uh, but unlike the vaccines, which are available at every pharmacy and which obviously 100% of adults know about, uh, there were not a lot of people that, that knew about this. Um, and then people that did weren't sure where to get it. And so as we saw that deficiency over the summer, uh, we did our best to raise awareness of this, to say, hey, if you're infected by COVID, this is something that could potentially help you resolve uh, the illness short of hospitalization. Uh, but we also wanted to provide easier access to folks. And so the sites that we have done, uh, we, of course, in the central Florida area um, here, we're happy uh, to have a, a site um, right here at St. Cloud Community Center. So kind of a soft opening now. If someone shows up uh, this afternoon, I'm sure they'll treat them. Uh, but starting tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. here at St. Cloud Community Center, this is going to be a monoclonal antibody treatment site, just like we have at Camping World Stadium, just like we have in, in Polk County and Merritt Island, Volusia County, Sumter, all those areas in this part of the state uh, that we have. We'll have one right here. It'll be open nine to five, seven days a week and it will be able to see uh, over 300 patients every day. Now, most of our sites do probably around 150 to 200 based on demand, but we do have several around the state that consistently do 250 to 300, even over 300 sometimes. If there's more demand at a particular site, then obviously we can move more resources there. Some of the sites do 100 or even 50 a day, and so we can obviously collapse that, make that a little smaller, and try to be nimble with it. Uh, so we think this will be very helpful for folks here in Osceola County. Now, they've obviously had access to go to Orlando or Merritt Island or Polk or wherever, uh, but this is right here in the community, so it does make it easier for people, and we're trying to make it as accessible as possible for folks uh, throughout this. Um, we'll hear from some folks um, who've had it, but I can just tell you the key on this is the early, early intervention. Uh, and for a long time, a lot of patients or a lot of people that would get infected uh, were basically expected to just stay home and hope it didn't get worse. And uh, we're here to just say in Florida, you know, we're not just going to hope, we want to act. And so here is a situation where, particularly for people that are at high risk of COVID complications, you have an early treatment option uh, that has proven to be successful, uh, not just in Florida, but, uh, but throughout the United States. So. Uh, we're glad that this is here. The, not only has the recognition increased a lot over these last weeks uh, here in Florida, but now even in other states. And other states are following Florida's lead with some of these sites. 
You have more demand for it. We get correspondence into my office all the time from other states saying, hey, thanks. I saw, saw your press coverage online, and then, I, and then I got infected a week later, and then I asked my doctor or whatever. So we're also there's more physicians that are now avail, uh, aware of this. Uh, not all physicians or even many physicians were not aware uh, of the monoclonal antibodies. And so we're doing a lot to raise awareness and to help a lot of people. Um, and, again, this will be open nine to five, seven days a week right here. If you want to look at all the areas where these sites are in Florida, you can go to floridahealthcovid19.gov. And if you want to make an appointment, just like we, we had this when we had the vaccine sites, you can go to patientportalfl.com and make an appointment. Now, this um, site uh, should be available for doing it. If it's not available right now, it will be by tonight. Um, they just have to populate it and make sure that it's working. Uh, this is something that is particularly beneficial for folks who are considered higher risk for severe COVID. So, of course, you're talking about elderly individuals. You're also talking about folks who are overweight. So anyone with a body mass index over 25 is somebody that's authorized. Also people that have kidney problems, diabetes, cardiovascular issue, issues, lung conditions. And so I would say, particularly when you start talking about people that are like 50 and above, you know, most of the people that are 50 and above are going to qualify um, in a lot of these things. We also have it authorized because Regeneron's been authorized for prophylaxis use. So you could have a situation where, you know, someone may get infected in a household. Maybe there's a vulnerable household member. They haven't developed symptoms yet. They can actually come in and get this as a prophylactics and hopefully ward off the infection entirely. So that is also something uh, that we're able to do. So early is the key. If you do it early, the results have been very good. This is not something for patients that are, say, hospitalized in intensive care. By that point, uh, the antibody, uh, one, it's not even approved at that stage of treatment, but uh, it's not something that's likely to turn the tide. If you do it early, you really can fight this back and have good success. So we're really happy about that. We're also happy to see that it is keeping people out of the hospital. I mean, we would have had thousands more that would have been admitted over these many weeks um, if it wasn't for uh, this program. So we're going to hear from some folks who were able uh, to get this, and they're going to talk about it. So we have Paula and David. Uh, they have a home here in St. Cloud, also um, down in Miami. And so they're going to come up and talk about uh, their story. So yeah, go ahead. Yep. Good afternoon. My name is Paula Roman, and I want to say thank you because it was extremely helpful to be able to drive over to Orlando and get the treatment. Um, I believe uh, my first symptoms was on a Thursday, and I remember getting in the car after picking up our oldest daughter from camp and thinking, if I close my eyes, I feel like I can fall asleep. Um, so I said a quick prayer and said, all right, Paola, here we go. You got an hour drive. And I got home. I said to my husband, I feel like I got to throw myself on the bed and sleep. So that was my first day of symptoms, and I had a week like that where it was extremely difficult to even just get up and shower, brush my teeth. I had to force myself to drink orange juice and have blueberries for dinner. I felt like from the bedroom to just going to get a water refill, my legs were like spaghetti, and it really just was a lot of headache, a lot of uh, tiredness and body ache. Um, and I believe, I'm pretty certain that I got it from my, my dear father. Um, when I kissed him on a Sunday afternoon as he was leaving, um, we later found out that he also was positive and um, in South Florida. He did not have the luxury of going to a center like we did here. He had to actually go to urgent care several times and then he was able to uh, get the treatment at an emergency room. Um, he's doing great, 70 years old. After the treatment, he's doing great. Um, but it was very hard, uh, so I was thankful to be able to go that Sunday. Um, if you're a mom and you hear your, your, your daughter when you're in quarantine say, Mom, can we cuddle? You know, that's another moment of uh, difficulty besides everything else that you're feeling. So I want to thank my husband for taking care of me. <laughs> and our daughters while I was going through all of this. And I think that's a great segue, right? Yeah. <laughs> Hello, my name is Dave Roman. And Governor, I just want to say thank you so much. And I'm sure your staff team who researched this and, and made this available. Uh, when my wife came home sick, 
I think, uh, like many husbands, uh, you, you get into a sense of uh, either fear or faith. And I knew that there were options and resources, so I just powered up uh, my internet connection and, and started to read as much as I could on what could be done. Um, and the way social media works, I didn't even know anything about uh, monoclonal antibodies, but all of a sudden on my social media feed came up an, uh, an advertisement uh, from the state saying that in Jacksonville they just opened up this, this treatment and um, it made me curious and I started researching and I saw that there was one within driving distance from our home here in St. Cloud. And uh, I spoke with our local doctor and I said, hey, is this legit? I mean, is this some sort of internet scam on my phone that just popped up? And uh, my doctor said, no, it's for real. And if you can get to it, I recommend doing it. Um, my wife got sick uh, a week before I did. And I think our biggest concern was we didn't both want to be sick at the same time with two little girls in the house. The worst thing about this was uh, self-quarantining in our home. My wife was in a front bedroom and I was taking care of our daughters, which was fantastic. Um, our daughters knew that my, my wife had COVID. Uh, we've been very upfront about not to fear this thing, but to let them know this is what's happening. Um, my wife was in the front room coughing and, and sneezing and, and I just couldn't wait for our appointment to come along. Um, I found out about this treatment, made the appointment on a Tuesday and it was on a, that following Sunday that uh, we were gonna have our, our appointment. And by that time, I still was tested negative. Uh, three times I tested negative. Uh, every Thursday, I'd go and just, just to see how I was doing. And I remember my daughter uh, came in one morning on a Monday with a, a fever. And I was, like any father, concerned and scared. I uh, immediately called our pediatrician, did a teleconference, and she said, just keep her fever down. Kids are resilient. They'll bounce back. Um, the next morning, a Tuesday, my second daughter, who is uh, five years old, showed up 100.4 fever. I did the exact same thing that my pediatrician said to do for my first daughter who is seven. And uh, I told my wife, it's not a matter of uh, if, but a matter of when, because they have both jumped in my bed when we were asleep and, and I've hugged them, I've kissed them and, I, and I've prayed over them. And sure enough, by that Thursday, I woke up with uh, the weirdest of dreams and immediately made an appointment for myself. And that Sunday, uh, I got the, uh, the Regeneron treatment and uh, literally by Tuesday, I was back up and I felt like myself again. Um, but Sunday was the worst, I'll be honest. Uh, waves of nausea and all kinds of just odd temperatures, spikes. Um, and again, there is real fear. And I think our, our culture, our society has done this disservice where instead of giving us information, they give us this fear. And, and I thought that uh, every little heartbeat that's buttered from anxiety and not from COVID was COVID. Uh, was able to get this treatment. And uh, again, I, I just feel like once it worked on me, I told my father-in-law about it. And I said, find a place. If you have to drive up here to Orlando and stay with us, we'll find a way to get you an appointment. Um, he couldn't make the drive. He was in an emergency room and they administered the uh, Regeneron treatment to him. And uh, sure enough, about four days later, he was back up to his normal joking self and bringing us uh, pan pizza. And it was great. So I just want to say thank you so much. Thank you. And just so um, uh, the point about the father and father-in-law, obviously this has been offered in Florida. There are health systems that offer it. You know, our sites are meant to be very convenient. We want people to use them, but there are other ones. Now we do have a site in Miami-Dade at Tropicana Park. We also have one in Broward County at CB Smith. And then we have one in West Palm Beach as well. So South Florida, all three of those South Florida counties have a state site, but I know a lot of their uh, other health care apparatus has also been doing this, which is, which is really good, and we're happy about that. Okay, uh, we have Dennis Sharp. Uh, he lives here in, in Osceola County, um, has a suppressed immune system, and after he tested positive early this month, he started to develop symptoms. And so he uh, asked uh, a physician, his physician, about the monoclonals, and uh, was able to, uh, uh, to get signed up for that, um, and also uh, eventually his mother uh, as well. So why don't you come in and tell your story? Thank you, Governor. Uh, Dennis Sharp, yes. Um, I'm treated for uh, cancer at uh, MD Anderson in Houston. I tested positive for COVID uh, in August, and uh, I reached out to them. 
they had just started doing the treatment out in Houston and advised me that I need to get the monoclonal treatment. Um, unfortunately, the sites have become such in demand that it was a two to three wait day wait time, which I wasn't comfortable doing. Um, I did reach out to uh, Representative Hawkins asking if we're going to get a site in Osceola County because um, I could tell it was needed based on checking all these sites in two to three days. Um, I did get the treatment on August 23rd. My symptoms leveled out, didn't get worse, and I uh, made it through within the 10-day quarantine. Uh, but on top of that, yes, my uh, mother in her 70s ended up with COVID as well. She was not aware of this treatment. I made her aware of it, and her and her husband, uh, who was not positive, were able to wait and get to one of the state sites and get the treatment. He has not become positive, and her symptoms uh, went away as well. And uh, another family member, my son and his uh, girlfriend, had a newborn last week. And upon leaving the hospital, they all tested positive for COVID. Unfortunately, the hospital wasn't giving them the treatment. Um, but we were able to get them into one of the state sites on Sunday and, uh, and get the treatment for uh, my son and his girlfriend. And luckily, the antibodies that they get from that treatment, we're told, will pass through to uh, the baby as well through the mother's milk. Uh, so she'll, uh, she'll be treated uh, as well. Uh, their symptoms seem to all have leveled out. My, my granddaughter does not have any symptoms. Uh, the mother's got a few, but they've leveled out, and my son's actually uh, been testing negative now. Uh, so I wish the state sites were easier when I had it, but I got it, and I was able to promote it to family members, and uh, you know, I'll continue to promote it to family, uh, friends, employees, or whatever they get it, and encourage them to get the treatment, because I really believe it helps to keep people from having those uh, long hospital stays uh, as the information I got from my medical team. So, but thank you all. Okay. Okay, Chrissy. I'm Chrissy Malukowitz, and uh, I tested positive for COVID on August 26th. Two weeks prior to that, my brother and his wife, who reside in Citrus County, tested positive for COVID. And my brother encouraged me the moment that I sent him the text that I tested positive to go get the antibody treatment. I didn't know anything about what monoclonal antibodies were. I had no idea what I was getting into. Um, all he would do would call my, my husband and say, get her into a treatment site. Uh, my brother was um, very, very sick. He had a fever for 10 days. He had dizziness. Um, aches, body pains, um, headaches. On day three of my symptoms, I couldn't even get out of bed. Um, I kept telling my brother, I'm going to go, I'm going to go. And the thought of even getting, to, getting into a car, I, I, it just it wasn't something that, that interested me. Um, my husband made an appointment uh, the third day that I had symptoms. He put me in our car and we drove an hour to Kiwanis Park over in Brevard County. And we walked in and I sat for 15 minutes, shivering with the chills with 102 fever. And we waited, they called us back. We got the treatment, we got the injections. Um, after we received the injections, we went into another room. They observed us for about 15 to 30 minutes and we left. That night was not easy. It was very, very difficult to get through. I continued with the fever and the chills. Um, but the next morning I woke up, my fever had broke. Um, no more chills, no more body aches, and I just had a dull headache. I thoroughly believe that these antibodies are here to help us, and I, I'm so incredibly grateful and thankful that our state has these available to us. Um, I know that if my brother did not go to get these antibodies on day nine, that he would have gotten pneumonia and been in the hospital. I also know that the severity of this horrible virus, it could have gotten me, it could have put me even further into being sick. I'm a working mom. I have two boys. Um, I have a husband who thankfully um, came to my rescue and he also came and he got the uh, antibodies at the same time I did. Fortunately, he still does not have COVID and we continually get tested. Um, so I just want to say thank you very much for bringing this to our state and to the citizens of the state of Florida. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Great. All right. Um, 
What do we got? Uh, oh, Bill. Thank you, Governor. Yep. Good afternoon. My name is Bill Sturgeon. I'm the city manager here in St. Cloud. And first off, Governor Sanders, thank you for your leadership in setting up this site. It was an easy decision for me when Mr. Um, um, the Osceola County Management Director called me and said he wanted to set up a monoclonal site. I have a personal story. Uh, two weeks ago, my daughter was diagnosed with COVID, drove herself to the hospital with difficulty breathing. I'm a former paramedic. I knew she was in a serious situation. And she was the third person in Putnam County to receive the monoclonal antibodies, and I attribute that to saving her life. So, again, thank you from the Krebs and the Sturgeon family. Thank sure. you, Governor. Absolutely. Right. Okay. Um, we have uh, Ken Shefke, Chief Medical Officer, Florida Division of Emergency Management. Thank you, Governor. So I think we all know now that COVID's not going, any, going away anytime soon. So to have the two arms of both prevention with the vaccines and treatment with the monoclonals is really important. The vaccines, we do know there's some breakthrough infections, but clearly it is keeping folks uh, from out of, keeping them out of the hospital, preventing severe disease, preventing death. And now that we, we've got one of them that are fully FDA authorized and there's additional safety studies in women, I, I think a lot of people are now choosing to get the vaccine, which I would encourage you to do if you're not yet vaccinated. But it takes a little while for those vaccines to kick in and give you that protection. And the piece we've been missing until the governor put this initiative out in Florida is the treatment phase. And that's where these monoclonal antibodies come in. And we've been using antibody therapy in medicine for decades. This is a safe therapy, great track record on it. And we target it for specific diseases like, like in this one, COVID, specifically against that particular virus. And there's all sorts of great stories. And as the governor mentioned, we have had this in Florida, but it just has not really been out there. The access has not been there. The awareness, even among medical professions, hasn't been there. Or even if they knew the therapy was there, they didn't know how to, how to get it or where to send people to. But now that we've got all these state sites that's, and you, see, you hear all these great testimonials, we even see a lot more of my colleagues are doing this in hospitals, urgent care centers, EMS. Uh, great story out of the panhandle just yesterday. It was a gentleman. He had lost a lung in his 20s from an ATV accident, only has one lung, came down with COVID, deathly afraid that he's going to have a bad outcome. Yeah, because of the governor's outreach, they, were, they got in touch with me. He went to not to even one of the state sites. He went to one of the local hospitals in the panhandle who now, kudos to them, have this therapy available. He got the therapy yesterday. And he's home now recovering. He fully feels that, that, that COVID, certainly he would have been hospitalized in ICU. He thinks that COVID it might, have, might have killed him. And now he's got a really good chance of recovery thanks to this treatment. Thank you, Governor. And so we're glad that, uh, that this could be here in Osceola. I mean, you know, when we had the Orlando one, we obviously knew that that could draw from neighboring counties. Uh, but there's a lot of folks in this region. So we got the Sumter County site, of course, Camping World Stadium, now this site, as well as Merritt Island. And then as you go uh, further north on 95 in Volusia County, we have a site. So we um, are, are happy with that footprint, but we think this is something that's really, really significant. And just so, uh, you know, people understand, this is something where, you know, people are being treated at these things who have uh, vaccination status or no vaccination status. Um, because I think if you look in Florida, the people that are the most vulnerable to COVID, overwhelmingly 90 plus percent of them elderly, other people with serious health issues um, are vaccinated. And, uh, you know, we are seeing breakthrough cases. Uh, the severity of those cases is less as a result of the protection the vaccine affords. But you do have folks, particularly very elderly people, um, who are becoming symptomatic even with fully vaccination. So when they're coming to get this treatment, you know, that's helping. So we've obviously had people, and you heard some of the stories about the family members who get resolved. But there's also been people fully vaccinated, elderly, get COVID, come into the site, get it still get hospitalized, but then get discharged. And a lot of the folks we've talked to, the physicians told them, look, if you had not done this, if you had not gotten the monoclonal, your outcome may have been, may have been worse. And so just understand treatment is about people that have been infected. Um, you know, it'd be great if th this had sterilizing immunity for the shots. Um, unfortunately, people are having, you know, the breakthrough are not that rare. So just know that this is out here. Uh, if you do come down with COVID, and I think that the, uh, the results have been very, very encouraging. We're very encouraged uh, by the decline that we've seen, uh, really rapid decline we're seeing uh, with, the, with the hospitalizations and the admissions. And this is obviously an important part of that. So we want to keep it going. And obviously, as we go forward in this, you know, how these things develop, people are going to know in Florida 
that, that if they do get this, particularly if they're at high risk, that there is, that there is an option. Like I mentioned, the Eli Lilly, now that's not something that we're using the Regeneron, but the Eli Lilly is now green-lighted for all 50 states again. So they had put it kind of on the back burner, so that, is, so that opens up more supply. Um, and then you have the one by GlaxoSmithKline, which the federal government doesn't really, I don't think they have an agreement there, but it's kind of on the market. And uh, so we're looking to see uh, about the availability of that as well. Regeneron, though, the only one where you can do subcutaneous injections. And so in terms of getting the number of people, I mean, you heard we, for a time, in a couple of our sites, they had booked out. We've, I think, solved that with more sites and, and expanded the appointments on each day. Um, but if you were only doing IV infusions, you wouldn't be able to do close to as many of the treatments as we're doing. I mean, we've got some sites that do basically 300 every day. Uh, if it was IV, you wouldn't be able to do that many because it takes a lot longer to administer um, an IV treatment. So this is, um, the, the shots really do make a difference. The other two monoclonals not yet approved for, for shots. They're, they're only through IV. Think they have a role. We'd like to expand their role in Florida as well. Uh, but in terms of our sites, being able to offer the shots in addition to the IV really, really is significant. Okay, happy to take some questions. Can I talk about the, the process that you're going through in terms of talking about those other two uh, monoclonal treatments right. um, in terms of IV versus shots? Can I talk a little bit about that? Okay, so, um, so in December, the uh, FDA approved for emergency use uh, Regeneron and Eli Lilly's monoclonal. So they're different components um, and they're, they're, they're different properties, but they both seek to do the same thing. Uh, when those were approved, that was approved for IV treatment. So our hospital started to do this, but they could do maybe like 50 in a day because you go in, you check in, you're on the machine for, for, for a, a, an hour, then they have to watch you. And so that's kind of how it's been through most of 2021. Recently, this summer, end of spring, beginning of summer, Regeneron got approved for inject subcutaneous injections. So that then made it to where this is something that more patients could access at a given site on a given day, and so that has increased our capacity uh, to do it. Um, the Eli Lilly got it got shelved for a while because the federal government was concerned about how effective it was against some of the variants. Uh, now they're, and so earlier last week they said, well, in these 20 states that have low variants, Florida wasn't one, you can do Eli Lilly. Now they said, I think at the end of last week, Eli Lilly is fine, it's holding up uh, well against, against the variants. And then you have the one by Glaxo, which was approved within the last three months. That has an, now Regeneron has massive amounts of data to support it. And I'm not saying that Glaxo is not effective. It probably is. The trial is great, 85% reduction in hospitalization, um, but it has not yet been used on this scale. We hope to be able to offer more of that in Florida. That, though, is not something the federal government as of now has purchased. And so if it is in a hospital or in a physician, it would basically be treated like any other medication. Uh, people would show insurance, Medicare, whatever. Now, they say, and we're looking at this, that between all the different rebates and reimbursements that are available from the feds, that it would not be a significant cost for patients. But we're looking into that and seeing, and we want to provide those options for people if that's what they want. But my sense is, because it's not, uh, it, you can't do the injections with it, that that would be something more that the hospitals and some of the health systems would do at infusion centers. Uh, our sites here would probably continue uh, with the shots. Governor, yes. vaccinations are still the number one weapon against the virus. So vaccinations are our top preventative measure. But once you're infected, the vaccine does not treat the, the, the disease. So they're two parts. They're just different sides of the coin, um, particularly when you're looking at uh, prevalence that, that may increase in the future, which, you know, hopefully we're, we're really going down well now. Hopefully that continues. But you got to assume when we get into the winter, like last year, you will see an increase. Now, we didn't see a sharp increase last winter compared to the summers, nevertheless. And so people should understand that this is something that's going to be there and that this is going to reduce your, 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 your likelihood of being hospitalized um, or dying if you do it on the prevention side. However, once you are infected, 
you need treatment at that point. And that is regardless of vaccination status. I mean, I think that clearly uh, the vaccines have reduced mortality amongst particularly elderly people who are the most vaccinated. That's really good news. At the same time, you know, we are seeing a lot of infections amongst vaccinated. And if you're high risk, you probably want a treatment option as well. So you do it. It's also the case that, and Dr. Shepke has pointed this out, um, when we rolled out these sites, you know, we were at the top, top of a wave, you know, when we started doing this, I think the second week of August. When you get vaccinated right then, it does take time to kick in. Uh, it takes four to six weeks, probably six weeks to really get the protection. And so at the top of a wave, it's not saying don't do it, but just understand you get it the next day, you're not necessarily having the protection kick in. So it's two sides of the same, of, of the same coin. One is prevention, one is treatment. Uh, but I can tell you, um, even, even Pfizer now has said, you know, they have the Pfizer vaccine, obviously, the only one that's fully FDA approved. CEO Pfizer said, you know, the battle against COVID is not just vaccines. It does require treatment. So they are, they are researching and trying to develop treatments. So I think it's both. I think you've got to do both. Um, and certainly have, I mean, look, we're not forcing anyone to take this monoclonal. It's your decision based on your health. Talk to your doctor or whatever. We just want people to know that it's available. But clearly, given the number of breakthrough infections that we're seeing, Clearly, given the fact that, you know, the vaccinations have been effective against preventing severe illness, but it hasn't created the type of herd immunity that we hoped, uh, we just have to know that people are going to come in contact with this. As someone, you know, if you're vaccinated, yeah, you very well may end up getting an infection. It'll most likely be very mild. It'll be equivalent to a cold in most people, which is great. Um, but for others, they could still potentially have severe outcomes, and so this gives you that opportunity. So I think you've got to use all the tools in the toolbox. This has nothing to do with any, all the speculation about me is purely manufactured. Um, I just do my job. You know, we work hard. Obviously, you know, our state, um, you know, has led on a lot of things, um, including on this now. Other states are copying us. Uh, but that's what it's really all about, just helping folks here. Um, and I hear all this stuff, and honestly, it's nonsense. Um, so, you know, I, I don't really know what to say to the rumors. Yes, sir. Well, I would, I would gently push back and say, we're really not the ones spending it. We disperse it to the school districts, and then the school districts do it. So we have not had requests for all that money yet. And so basically, as we field requests, we do it. You know, the school districts have gotten a lot of money over this period of time, and so some of the earlier iterations, you know, some of them are still working through that. So it is absolutely not a situation where we're not willing to disperse. As we get requests in, we will absolutely disperse. But many school districts haven't necessarily asked for, for a lot yet, um, and so we'll see how that goes. But it's all dependent upon, upon those requests. We are not spending it directly. Uh, well, there are some. There is some money. that the, the, we, But for the school districts, you know, that is something that is dispersed to the districts, and then, and then they're spending. And when they submit the request and do it, uh, we could do it. But this is only one of many different uh, pots of money uh, that has been sent down. There's been a lot of money. Uh, that's been uh, that's been dedicated uh, to this, so they've had access to a lot of different funds. So the it's a great question. How long will this be open, and how long will it be free to most people? Certainly, given the relationship between the federal government and Regeneron, we anticipate the Regeneron remaining to be free for the foreseeable future. We think that that's important. Uh, we think it's important that this is something that's accessible to all. Uh, how these sites are going to go, um, you know, we have no plans now to, uh, uh, to, to stop doing this in the foreseeable future. As certain sites perform less, you know, we may move some stuff around. I mean, we have some sites that, that just don't do as much traffic, and that's fine. In some respects, it's a good thing. Maybe there's probably fewer people that need the treatment, but we'll, we'll look at that. I do think, though, that this was really, we did this 
It's like necessity is the mother of invention. We saw that people didn't know about this. We saw that a lot of people in the medical community didn't know about it or didn't know it was available. So we felt the need to come in and do it. Ideally, you would have the medical uh, community uh, be able to just handle this as a matter of course. So we're looking at different ways that that, that could potentially be done. Uh, but as long as this, there's a need for it, you know, we want to be we want to be part of this. My hope is is that. Um, uh, we get to the point where, obviously, the Regeneron, I'd like to have Glaxo and Eli, Ho Eli Lilly one. I hope that's readily available throughout Florida. We're, gonna, we're working and seeing kind of where that is. Obviously, a lot of the hospitals and, and doctors, they will just draw this down directly. It doesn't involve the state government. Um, and really, the Regeneron is drawn down directly by providers, too. It's not all like we're dispersing all of it. They get it drawn down and sent. Now, we can get it drawn down and sent to us, too, and that's what we're doing for these sites. So I think you're going to see, hopefully, an expansion with some of these other monoclonals, uh, which will be good and hopefully will prove to be as effective as Regeneron. And then it's something where you don't even need to potentially have a site. But we're not there yet, and we think that this is something that has helped an awful lot of people, and we want to continue to be helpful in terms of what, um, what folks need to be able to recover. You know, when you're talking about this, and you know, we've heard, I mean, the stories we get are just unbelievable. Um, you know, there was a lady in Jacksonville, she spoke at one of our events. She was passed out on the floor in the antibody site and the, 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 it went viral. And she basically said, look, I was on day nine. I, I was headed right to the ICU. My mother told me that, that the state had set this up. She saw the governor's press conference. I dragged myself to the site in Jacksonville, got the treatment. And a couple days later, I was on my feet, no chance of going to the hospital or anything. And so you think about that, and for too long, people were basically told there's nothing that can be done uh, until you get to be hospitalized. And that's just obviously not true. And so we want people to know that getting in early and, and taking action can make all the difference. And so, yes, number one goal, early treatment, saving lives, uh, but also even if just to be hospitalized is no fun, even though most people that get hospitalized recover, that's no fun to have to be in the hospital for five days or seven days. Uh, so if we can uh, resolve this short of that, man, we got to take that uh, opportunity too. It also helps to have, you're seeing a big decompression now uh, with the declining hospitalizations. You know, that's very important uh, just because staff is tight in medical everywhere in the country. When the COVID census goes up, uh, it really strains a lot of the folks uh, who are working on the front lines. And they've done a really good job in Florida. We really appreciate it. Uh, but that's another factor that really helps um, helps everybody out. And then just the people to get on their feet quicker, people, they have families, they have jobs, they have stuff they got to tend to. And to be able to take an illness that could be a 10 to 12 day deal where they're bedridden, even short of hospitalization, if that can be resolved, in, in days uh, with, with the symptoms going away and you feeling better, man, that's so much better for the, themselves, their families, and everything around them. So, it, so it's really important to do, and we're going to continue uh, to do it. We are not fully done with the sites. So we had done the 21, and we thought that it was pretty good. But then we did hear from people that said, hey, I had to drive all the way to Brevard. Or some folks in the Panhandle had to drive all the way to Fort Walton Beach from like Pensacola. And not that those are like four hour drives, but you know, when you're sick, that's not the easiest thing to do. So we said, okay, where can we add it to make it more convenient? So Osceola County, one of them. We're going to do another one in Highlands County uh, to help with some of the rural communities. So that's going to come online this week. We did start one in Pensacola to supplement the Fort Walton and the Panama City. So you have three now in the Florida Panhandle. And then we're working for another one um, on the east coast of Florida. Uh, I'm in Palm Coast, hopefully be able to announce that very soon. So that is, I mean, you know, from Jacksonville down, there's going to be a bunch of them on that I-95 corridor, obviously here in central Florida, very good, strong in Tampa Bay, southwest, and that's uh, really the, the name of the game. So we think that this will make a difference. And again, starting tomorrow morning, 9 a.m., 300 patients uh, can be seen at this site. And so if you're somebody that is COVID positive, particularly if you're older, uh, if you have uh, cardiovascular issues, if you're overweight, if you have diabetes, if you have kidney problems, if you have some of those underlying comorbidities that have uh, seen the most severe COVID cases, the people that end up being hospitalized, 
please take advantage of this. Of course, consult with your physician, talk to your family. This is not mandatory. This is just for your, for, for your availability. But if you can come in and get this early, you know, the chance of you being up on your feet uh, increases dramatically. So we're happy to be here and look forward to serving a lot of patients. I got to run. We'll take care. You want to talk to some of them? Yes, they are.